Thanks a lot to all. Thanks to speakers. We have a panel on basically on the, the policy dimension of macroprudential stress testing. Um, we have Diane Perret from uh, the University of Luxembourg, uh, Beverly Hilton, Hirtl, uh, Vice President uh, for Research, um, Fed New York, um, Jesus Saurina, who is the Director General, Financial Stability, Regulation and Resolution, Banco de España, Martin Chihak, who's the um, Head of Stress Testing in the IMF, and I'm Camero Saleo, Head of the Stress Testing Division in the ECB in Financial Stability. Um, we tried with this um, with this panel. We'll try to cover lots of ground. Uh, so these are going to be you know, high-level short interventions. We'll try to keep some time for questions and, and answers at the end. Um, I think we will have um, the annual start with uh, um, her views on what exactly is the um, no, the measure you want to look at when you know, vulnerability when you're doing a macroprudential stress test. Uh, and then Beverly will, will give us some views on in what direction we should be developing um, stress testing to make this an effective uh, policy tool. I will give some perspective on, on how actually this can be used to calibrate macroprudential policies. Um, then Jesus will, uh, will share some views on how to coordinate the, the macroprudential and the microprudential stress test. Uh, and, and finally, uh, Martin will tell us about um, communication challenges of exercises which are complicated, um, and especially when you move into the policy domain, uh, the, the translation is not always immediate, and you know, you've heard uh, today also how important communication is and transparency and stress testing, so um, this is really an overarching argument topic. And now, without further ado, I'll give um, the end the pointer and. Uh, how does it work? Well, okay, I guess it's on forever. <laughs> is this one working? Yes. Well, first of all, uh, let me thank you for inviting me uh, on to sit on a panel of such uh, distinguished uh, panelists. I feel uh, very. Uh, <laughs> Very impressed here. So um, here, uh, what I want to talk about today, so you asked me my view on what's the right measure of vulnerability of, of a bank, and I think if there was one, uh, we would be out of business, right? Uh, so, so probably uh, this is, this is, there's no such a thing as a right measure. Um, there, I think, Probably you want to use multiple measures. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, as much as information as you, as you can have. I'm an econometrician by training, so the information set uh, should should increase to 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 to, to uh, inform your view. Um, but why do we need so many measures, and and why do we need a stress test? Why do we need supervision? In the end, I think uh, what I wanted to talk today is about this this trilogy that we have between. Um, when we talk about supervision, we have this interaction with capital requirements and, and regulatory arbitrage. So if there was uh, no rules, there would not be uh, room for checking the rules and, and having supervisors that make sure that these rules, uh, these requirements are implemented. And if there was no regulatory arbitrage, probably rules would be enough and, and we would be also out of business. Um, so I want to I wanna talk about, about this, this equilibrium that we have between capital requirements, supervision, and regulatory arbitrage, and see a little bit how when you move one, what happens to the, to the other two. Uh, and my way of thinking of stress test is, stress test to me is the emblematic example where uh, capital requirements and supervision are intertwined. Uh, and and what we've seen in most countries uh, in the U.S. in Europe is that with the implementation of stress tests, you have both ca higher uh, capital requirements and enhanced supervision. At the same time, for the same group of banks, the largest uh, the largest banks. Um, so why? Do we think that supervision is important? Is that we actually uh, saw that this was, st this still plays a role uh, uh, in the US, that the, the, 
in identifying this direct effect of, uh, of stress test supervision was actually what was working in, in reducing risk-taking incentives uh, um, at, at banks. And, and that is because uh, without doing that, we would not actually have seen any effect on, on, on risk-taking. So not disentangling between supervision capital requirement and the effect that stress tests have on capital requirement would not have been able, we didn't see any, any effect whatsoever of uh, stress test on, 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 on bank risk-taking. So why is that? It's because, well, there is an effect of capital requirement. So banks are actually responding to um, to capital requirement, there is no separation between capital structure and investment decision, as I, as I, 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 I also uh, explained in, in my discussion. And uh, well, this irrelevance of Modigliani Miller for banks doesn't only mean that um, with conventional wisdom would think you increase capital, banks should be safer, right? Um, here, banks also respond to that, to, uh, and they could actually take more risk, such that by taking on more risk, you actually end up with banks that are, are, are riskier. And why would they take more risk is because, well, we have in mind this, this increase in cost of funding that comes when uh, equity is costlier than debt, which could be very well be the case um, in, in, for banks, knowing that uh, there's deposit insurance and banks don't fully pay for the deposit insurance. So with this increase in the cost of funding, banks could optimally respond by taking on more risk. Um, could be uh, the opposite channel, skin in the game, uh, more skin in the game that would prevail. But what actually we found in the data is that uh, banks tend to, to respond to increases in capital requirement by taking on more risk in the short run. And, and this is something that actually regulation is based on. Uh, Basel capital requirements is based on this principle that you should ask for more capital for the riskier exposures in order to prevent these banks to actually at each time take more risk when they have higher capital requirements. So the idea since even Basel I was to link capital requirement to asset riskiness through regulatory risk weights. Now, if this is included in capital requirements, why do we, again, do, why do we need supervision uh, if, if capital requirements reflect, uh, already reflect uh, asset riskiness? And, and I mean, then I go back to the evidence on regulatory arbitrage. So there is, uh, so even if capital requirements uh, reflect risk, they don't fully reflect risk or they don't fully reflect risk in a dynamic manner, and, and banks are going to always shift their portfolio towards uh, the most underestimated risk weight class, asset class, so for example, mortgage-backed securities during financial crisis, sovereign bonds during the European sovereign debt crisis. And, 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 that, and this is where I think market measures of risk or additional measures that the regulator is not necessarily using to assess the banks on a on day-to-day -day basis can be useful to flag uh, those episodes where regulatory arbitrage is, is, uh, is very important. So why are market measures of risk interesting and, and, and useful here is because by definition they are not uh, subject to regulatory arbitrage. You might say they might be wrong, they might, they might, they might have other, many other caveats, but at least they are not subject to regulatory arbitrage. So they will reflect a ranking of bank riskiness that might not be the same ranking as bank riskiness according to uh, regulatory risk weights. And, and I think when this can be informative is when you have actually a negative correlation. When the market participants think that the riskiest banks are actually the banks that have the lowest risk weights and have the, the lowest capital requirements, um, then that can tell you something about whether uh, risk weights correctly reflect risk and whether there is, a, there is, a, there is, there is regulatory arbitrage. It was the case uh, in 2011 for the 2011 stress test in Europe where we saw a very negative correlation with market risk weights, market implied risk weights uh, coming from the fact that many banks actually were loaded on, on, on risky sovereign bonds. But you see that uh, in all the stress tests, this has, this has continued to be a negative uh, correlation. Uh, sometimes it's because of low market to book ratio, sometimes it's because of other reasons, but it, this is a red flag, right? Once you have this flag, then you're like, 
why, why is this so? Let's dig a little bit deeper in the data and try to figure out what, what's going on. Also, in more recent research, we saw that the more the more stringent capital requirement a bank face depends on risk weights, the more banks are going to respond to, risk, to increases in, uh, in capital requirements by taking on more risk. So. Um, there, there is, there is this, this, uh, this evidence uh, all over uh, the place there. Uh, not only uh, that banks are doing regulatory arbitrage, but they're also doing regulatory arbitrage uh, in stress tests. So this is where supervision has the most important roles when capital requirements are high. Um, this, this, uh, this supervision can, 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 can play an important role. Before the crisis, we, we know that there was a lot of regulatory arbitrage because there was a lot of opportunities to do so. You had only uh, four different buckets, risk buckets, loosely uh, defined risk weights in the Basel one. So banks could very well uh, go for their riskiest assets without, within a, a, a risk weight class. Now there are less opportunities to do regulatory arbitrage. You have more uh, precise risk weights. Uh, you have also more stringent capital requirements. But still, we find a very important role for qualitative supervision. So I'm going to just uh, leave it uh, with open questions and say, well, maybe the opportunities have decreased, but maybe the incentives have changed too to engage in regulatory arbitrage. And, and that's maybe where we want to think about what's the role of supervision when banks' uh, capital requirements are high versus low, whether supervision and capital requirements or high capital requirements are substitutes. It seems that there was a little bit of this discussion, uh, at least in the US, with the Financial Choice Act to see high capital requirements as a substitute to stress test supervision. I don't think that's going to go through, but I'm saying this has been on the table at some point, and, and this is, uh, this our questions to, to think about. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, sorry, we'll move on. Beverly, let's see if I can. So thank you. I'll, I'll, while the slides come up, I'll say everything I'm going to say today is from the perspective of the US stress test, which is what I know about. But at the end, I'm going to try to draw some lessons that I think apply more broadly. I hope apply more broadly. So. Great. So I have to start with a disclaimer. We'll move through this. I was going to start off by telling you all about the details of the US stress tests that's been fortunately covered already. The key thing for my remarks is to, to pull out of this is that the way we calculate the stress tests is they're calculated for individual banks, and they're part of a broader program, the CCAR program, which has um, implications for the individual banks that are in the, in the program. Um, let me spend just a moment here because I don't think this has been discussed quite as much today. So what are the key elements of the stress test that we do for CCAR and for the Dodd-Frank Act, which is the stress test, which is what DFAS stands for? The macro scenario um, that gets fed in is gets more stringent as the economy improves. That's sort of built into the way the scenario is designed. The unemployment rate must go up by a certain amount and must hit, hit a certain level. So as the unemployment rate has fallen in the US, the amount by which the unemployment rate increases um, in the scenario has gone way up. There are similar, uh, or in a different vein, the way it's done, but similar ideas for what happens to housing prices and other asset prices. They will tend to fall more as they've been running um, above trend. Um, another thing to know is that we do these series of uh, what uh, you would call a top-down models, meaning that, that we do the estimates. There's also bottom-up modeling as part of the CCAR program. Today, everything I'm going to talk about is, is what the Fed does, our top-down models. So basically, those results are we have our own models. They are The models are the same for everybody, but we get a lot of very, very granular um, data from the banks. And so um, same model, same macro scenario, but the differences are in the data that, that, that feeds in, that comes to mm -hmm. the bank, that comes from the banks. So I thought it was helpful, maybe helpful to take just a moment to think about um, if we're talking about macroprudential stress tests, what do we mean by macroprudential? 
Um, other people have talked about the distinction I'm going to make um, here. I'm certainly not the first, but I think there's two different ways of thinking about what macroprudential means. One is from kind of a structural um, view that's about identifying important nodes in the system, those institutions where if something happens, the negative externalities associated with distress or failure are um, the most severe and pervasive in the system. And when you think about the policy implications of that, it has something to do with strengthening the prudential requirements and supervision at those systemically important nodes in, in the banking or financial system. And then there's the view of macroprudential that I think has uh, you know, been the focus of what we've mostly talked about today, which is the cyclical view, which is how are risks of financial stability changing over time, understanding the cycles in credit, asset prices, leverage, liquidity, all the things that we've been talking about today. And there the policy implications are something about lessening the probability and or the consequences of a turning of the cycle. So um, in, in playing those two different thoughts on to what we actually do in the U.S. stress test, um, ha as has already been talked about, um, what we do is actually uh, project regulatory capital ratios for the banks in the stress tests, um, um, you know, sort of nine quarters forward under the scenario, very much uh, regulatory capital and accounting-based calculations. Um, um, but what I really want to focus on here is how the stress tests are calculated. So the stress tests are calculated for each of the banks individually on a standalone approach. There's a lot of attention to uh, projecting out the different pieces of net income and then, and, and, and then how that impacts capital. Um, but basically, given the scenario, given the models, given the individual bank data, what happens at bank A, at, to bank A in the, in, the, in the calculations doesn't affect what happens at bank B or vice versa, except as Don Cohn said, the general scenario is one in which things would be pretty bad for banks um, in general. So in thinking about the structural macroprudential elements, you know, why, why do we, how do we come to do this, um, you know, bank by bank calculations? Um, and I think it's important to remember how the results are used, um, you know, dating back to the first time we did stress tests in the middle of the crisis in 2009 and now is embedded in CCAR, you know, the, the results of the stress tests have consequences uh, for the individual banks, both supervisory consequences um, in terms of the supervisory observations that they will get and then potentially consequences for their ability to increase their dividends and repurchases to shareholders. So because of the sort of micro prudential implications of, of the stress test, the push in the modeling and thinking about it, I would argue, has been towards sort of accuracy and pre precision at the firm level. Make the models, even though the models are the same for everybody, get more and more detailed data, have the models, um, you know, be, reflect particular kinds of lending that, you know, that different banks are doing so that you really get the numbers given the scenario as, as correct as possible um, at the individual banks. I would say this, um, you know, arguably addresses the structural macroprudential concerns that that we talked about a min um, that I talked about a minute ago. Um, the primary cyclical element is are the, the the design of the scenario, the scenarios, which, as I said, are designed to be more severe when times are good. Um, uh, uh, but as has already been talked about by Don and others, these countercyclical um, elements compete against improvements in asset quality. There's a little bit of a horse race there, and Don's work with Nellie Lang suggests that the horse race is, you know, maybe a tie, or um, that the asset quality, the improvement asset quality, is winning. And most of the sort of um, countercyclical elements of the stress test has to do with the fact that dividends and share purchases, which figure into the ultimate capital ratios have gone up and increased pretty steadily during the expansion. So, you know, what kind of macroprudential insights do we get out of the stress tests? I mean, I think there's some limits that it's important to acknowledge. First of all, these are capital stress tests and um, don't directly capture liquidity runs, fire sale risks of, of the type we just were hearing about. The large U.S. banks are separate, are subject to a separate liquidity stress test as part of the CLAR program, but those stress tests are separate from the capital ones. They aren't linked together. 
Um, the standalone approach means that all the linkages you might like to know about bank to bank, banks to non-banks, the, the financial sector back to the real economy, we don't, we don't really capture in, in these stress tests, um, except again is from the fact that the scenario is really, really bad and sort of already presumes that there's a lot of trouble um, in the economy in the banking sector. Um, and um, again, relevant to, the, to some of what we just heard, the really complex models and the, the high level of granular data, loan level um, in, in many cases, um, mean that generating the projections is really you know, sort of resource and labor intensive and it's hard to do more than a handful of scenarios raising questions about you know, whether all the risks are being captured um, you know, will the vulnerabilities at all the banks be identified? So what does this imply for some of the design choices? This is what I was actually asked to speak about finally on the last slide here. Um, so I think some of the things to think about is where should the complexity be? In this microprudential setting, as I've said, we drove a lot of complexity um, to get the numbers right at a, at a detailed level for individual banks. Maybe if the, if the concern is the system as a whole, the complexity should be at capturing how what happens in one part of the system affects another part of the system. So thinking about the purpose of the tests, where do you want to put the complexity in the modeling and the data collection? Um, in terms of data collection, um, maybe there's a role for more sort of high frequency interday transactions that really capture the way funding moves um, you know, during the day. Um, and you know, over the course of days, um, you know, between institutions, um, and then of course there's the data, you know, sort of the low-hanging fruit to mention the data from the non-banks and from uh, what in the U.S. is a very important, you know, unregulated sector. Um, sort of the, the uh, so how complete a picture do we get by looking at the banking sector alone? And then, has, as has already been talked about, um, the ability to do many scenarios, not just a handful. So I think that's my. Thanks a lot. Now, let's. Okay, so uh, a few thoughts about how one can use macroprudential stress tests to calibrate uh, macroprudential policies. Uh, um, so, you know, basically, what is a macroprudential stress test? In the end, you're projecting along the most likely path of your variables. That's a baseline scenario. And then you have a scenario where you have severe shocks. Let's say people say severe but plausible. That would be the adverse scenario. And ideally, you have interactions. So institutions react to these shocks and maybe interact with each other. And that feeds back into the economy. You know? <laughs> So on the, that's a macroprudential stress test, and, and how do you calibrate, on the other hand, when you think of calibrating a macroprudential policy, how do you look at that? Well, you know, standard approach to policy making is to do a cost-benefit analysis. Now, in, in the field, in the specific field of macroprudential policy, there's some challenges, because costs are relatively straightforward. We're talking about uh, solvency measures, so increasing capital or borrower-based measures. But anyway, usually what this does, this slows down the economy one way or another. If it's a capital measure, you're restricting a bit the supplier credit. Because you're doing it in normal times, um, you, know, you have to measure the impact along your baseline scenario. So you have a, a little bit of a slowdown in the economy. But what are the benefits? Now, it's unclear what the benefits are, or there's many ways of looking at it. One way of looking at it, uh, of course, first of all, the benefits should be in some sort of comparable unit. If you say that the benefits are something that, uh, that is not expressed in the same unit, then it becomes very difficult to compare. Uh, so what, what people have been done for a while is to do some sort of macro analog of, of the micro perspective and an expected loss approach. So you say, well, if banks are more resilient, there's a lower probability of a crisis and or a lower cost of a crisis and therefore you have a lower expected loss. And, and then you compare these two magnitudes, the output you lose uh, because you put the policy versus the, the output you gain in expectation because you have averted a, a crisis, or you've made it less expensive. Now the, the problem here, beyond the fact that macro is probably not exactly an analog of micro, but without getting into philosophical issues, measuring that is, is very difficult. 
uh, first of all, because crisis events are, are, are few and they're, they tend to be highly correlated. And they're at country level, so you're comparing different countries, and these are small samples. And so how meaningful is it if you have in your sample and you are uh, you know, a European country to have a crisis in Mexico? It's, it's meaningful to an extent, but it's not incredibly meaningful all the time, especially if the crisis in Mexico was 30 years ago, um, which is what you have in your samples. And then when you estimated your, it's not unclear what the cost of a crisis is. For some people, it's a loss of output in a few years following the crisis. For others, it's, uh, it's a change in growth rate. Now, if you express a change in growth rate in, in GDP levels, you basically have an infinite amount. So you have estimates of the cost of crisis that can go into the hundreds of points of GDPs. Uh, and so it's a bit complicated to put this, all this together because you have such a w wide variation in what the, your measurement of benefit is that when you compare it to these costs which are small fractions of, of GDP, then it becomes very complicated. Uh, now what would be an alternative approach uh, to look at the benefits of macroprudential policy, which relies less on rare events. And basically, the idea here is to consider that the macroprudential policy, what it does, it makes your, your financial system more resilient, uh, not in terms of avoiding a crisis, which is an extreme event, but in, in reducing the... Um, the probability and the depth of a, of a severe downturn in the economy. Now, that's something that happens a lot more. Uh, it, it's, you have more observations. It's a more, let's say, uh, run-of-the-mill concept uh, that you can see what is the impact of having banks in better shape or financial system in better shape when you have a severe downturn. And now, where does uh, stress testing come in? Well, stress testing, basically, if you think of it, already provides you with the infrastructure to compare these things because you can see what is the cost of introducing a macroprudential measure by taking your stress testing infrastructure uh, and going through the baseline without any macroprudential measure, so that's just projecting things as they are, versus by introducing your macroprudential measure, uh, which means that if you allow banks to react to, to that, in your model you will have that you're imposing an increase uh, in capital requirements and therefore banks uh, uh, the cost of, of um, the weighted average cost of credit will increase a little bit, and therefore you will have a little bit of a slowdown, and that can be done very easily with the models we have. And that's your cost. And as for the benefits, well, the adverse scenario is a severe but plausible downturn. So it's something that that is not entirely a fully fledged systemic crisis, but it's still severe enough that it makes sense to want a, a resilient system because there, there should be benefits there. And there again, you see what the path of the economy would be without the measure compared to with the measure, and hopefully, if the measure works, you have introduced, for example, a capital buffer that the banks can use, and then they will be deleveraging less by using the buffer than they would have without that buffer, and therefore, your, your, your path of the economy will be slightly less, less bad than it would have been otherwise. And then you have, uh, in this system, you can directly compare your, your cost and your benefits, you have estimated it with the same, with the same model. Uh, you've done it for your own country, you didn't need to do cross-country. Um, you have more observations, you have measures that are consistent with each other, and that can give you a perspective on how to calibrate your, uh, your, your policies. Now, there is also an issue of what is the value to you as a policymaker of a unit of output in good times versus a unit of output in bad times, but we won't get there. Let's just assume the risk neutrality and they have the same value, but they don't need to be. Now, what would be an extension of this consistent approach? Instead of having one adverse scenario, like Beverly was saying, it would be interesting to have many different scenarios because with many different scenarios, you can cover a wider variety of risks. So uh, if you, your technology allows you to have multiple scenarios, uh, in the limit, you can basically model a whole distribution of outcomes. The more scenarios you have, the more you have the whole shape of, uh, of outcomes, and then you can see how the distribution changes with and without your macroprudential measure. Then that would be a robust and a complete assessment of the impact of, of your measure, uh, and you, know, you would be confident, you could also actually also see in what type of scenarios your measure isn't working very well. So this is basically, if you want, an approach uh, that is equivalent to growth at risk, but in the policy space. Growth at risk uh, is, has been thought of as a way to identify uh, 
risks, how they materialize, so something like loser financial conditions today translate into a different shape of the distribution of output tomorrow. And here the idea is the same. Uh, an introduction of a policy measure today will change the shape of the distribution of, of output tomorrow. Um, so here you, you can see what this would look like. Uh, the blue line is, is your baseline and then you introduce your measure and you have that blue pocket. That's because uh, the economy has slowed down a bit. Now it could be the case that after that it picks up again. So you, you look at these pockets and you compare them. And what, what is your benefit is that the, the lower line, uh, that's your path of output in the adverse scenario. And, and you can see the, the red dotted line is where you would be if you had your policy measure. And the gain is a green shaded area. And this is just for, for two cases, but imagine this with the whole distribution and you can just compare the distributions. Uh, so what are the, the, the benefits of, of this approach compared to other ways of, of looking at macroprudential policies? Well, compared to standard macro models, here in the stress testing framework, you can um, you take into account the heterogeneity of, of institutions uh, in your sample. Now, sometimes it doesn't matter, but most of time, most time it matters. There's a big difference in having all banks that have... Um, a management buffer of 2%, say, versus half of your system being very, very close to, the, to their thresholds and half of the system having a lot of extra capital. The, the reaction would be different, but that you can only capture if you have a, a model that goes at the institution level. Um, now, compared to the, the standard growth at risk uh, model, what you need for policies, you need to understand the transmission channels. At the ECB, we have developed a model that is... Um, semi-structural for, for, the, for the macro part, uh, and this allows us to, to understand the transmission rather than a reduced form where you're just correlating things. So in the policy space, it, it pays off to, to have some structure. Uh, if you move to multiple scenarios, you can also uh, experiment with, uh, with all sorts of environments and assumptions about your parameters. And, and in the end, this kind of approach gives you lots of uh, internally consistent outcomes. You can look at, at growth at risk or at capital at risk, if you want to call it, credit at risk, whatever you want. You can look at, decide what is the distribution that's relevant for you and, um, and look at it in this space. Now, of course, what are the cons of this? Well, this requires large investment and it's quite complicated. Uh, to run, and you know, as Beverly was saying before, if you put in all, in all this also interactions uh, among institutions and so on, and you don't limit yourself to banks, but to put the whole financial system, this can quickly become completely unmanageable. Now, I mean, in Europe, we are relatively lucky because banks are still quite central. So, if we confine ourselves to banks, we're not too wrong. Uh, but that's not necessarily the case everywhere. Um, so the bottom line here is that the macroprudential stress test framework is really, if you look at it as a tool and not as, as, as an end in itself, it's really a natural candidate for policy evaluation um, because it provides estimates of outcomes in a likely and in a bad outcome, which is pretty much what you want in financial stability because what you care about is the left tail of your distribution. Um, conceptually, this can be mapped into growth at risk, which is uh, a, a nice, elegant, and consistent uh, intellectual framework to look at things, uh, which is probably more satisfying than the ad hoc uh, macro analog to, to micro reasoning. Um, and of course, there's technical challenges that uh, include the integration of, of, of system-wide considerations, and then also communicating that you have decided on policy measures with, with this kind of concept, uh, it's not necessarily straightforward, but I guess Martin will give us some perspectives on communication. And with this, I pass the ball to Jesus, who you very much, doesn't uh, have slides, so we'll... Thank you very much, uh, Carmelo. Uh, let me start by thanking uh, the, the ECB, and in particular you, for uh, inviting me to this uh, panel. It's really an, an, a pleasure and an honor to be here. If there is a prize in this conference for the laziest uh, guy, this is for me, because as Carmelo mentioned, I have now a slide, not a single PowerPoint uh, slide. I'm not the, the odd one out just only for that. Uh, I'm just, I'm only the odd one out uh, uh, because uh, this is a conference basically about uh, uh, the frontier of stress tests. Uh, you, all of you work in that uh, frontier. Uh, my remarks uh, focus on three points that are far, far, far away from that uh, frontier of, uh, of the knowledge. Uh, 
these three remarks are very simple, uh, no complexity that uh, I think that uh, the whole program of the conference has been to me too uh, complex, probably I'm getting uh, too old uh, uh, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, business, but uh, still I think that uh, they may be useful uh, for focusing your, uh, your analysis. Uh, these uh, three remarks uh, come from more than 15 years of uh, stress testing practical experience, uh, starting with 2005, 2006 uh, uh, FSAP uh, IMF uh, stress test a very nice uh, exercise. Then uh, it came the 2011-2012 uh, uh, FSAP stress test. Then it came uh, the Troika-led uh, stress test, and I still have some friends uh, from that exercise. Uh, John is not here. Matthias is, uh, is at the end of the, of the uh, uh, room, uh, Edward. Then it came the 2014 uh, uh, ECB or SSM stress testing, and then it came uh, our uh, annual stress test of all our, our banks. So I hope that these uh, three remarks are useful for, uh, uh, for you. The first one has to do with stress tests in, in bad times. They can be extremely useful uh, to enhance financial stability and to recover confidence in the banking sector they can also be useless. I think that the, the stress test uh, uh, in the US in 2009, also the Spanish bank's stress test in 2012, are uh, perfect examples of uh, uh, extremely successful uh, stress test to regain confidence and to regain uh, financial, financial stability. Uh, this comment, you are not going to like it. Uh, the key determinant of the success of a stress test in bad times, uh, for me, is the existence of a backstop. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, 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 matter whether you have a very nice scenario, one scenario, 400 scenarios, 20,000 scenarios, whether you have uh, very good models, whether you have very good methodologies, in bad times, what you need to have a successful stress test is a backstop. If you don't have a backstop, then uh, the stress test becomes much more uh, complex. I know that this is uh, obvious, but I think it's important not to forget it. My second comment has to do with uh, top-down versus uh, bottom-up uh, stress test. So the, basically, I know that uh, uh, stress tests can be very complex. Uh, some of the papers have shown this, but for me, the stress test uh, conceptually is uh, relatively simple. It's basically, you have a starting point of exposures, uh, capital levels, and profitability. You have uh, scenarios, and you have an engine to transform uh, the scenarios or to apply the scenarios over the initial exposures, and that then get the final uh, capital, uh, uh, capital depletion. So the key, the key variable here is who controls the engine of this exercise. Conceptually, uh, relatively simple. Top down for me means that the control is in the hands of the authorities. Bottom up stress, stress test means control by the banks. And uh, if the control is uh, by the banks, then you have a huge amount of resources devoted uh, uh, to a, a kind of uh, make this uh, bottom-up stress test converge with the idea that uh, the supervisor uh, may, uh, may have. So to me, clearly, uh, the, the top-down is uh, uh, something that needs to be uh, reflected uh, carefully because it means that uh, like in the US, the control of the engine is in the hands of the uh, competent authorities. And I think that this deserves, uh, 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 this deserves uh, some uh, thoughtful uh, uh, discussion. And finally, the top down can be very granular. We have a, a modest uh, stress testing tool in Spain, it's called Flesby. Uh, some of uh, Matthias know it uh, very well because it was something that we developed to get out uh, of the, uh, uh, of the program in 2013. We use it and it was very successful. We have keep increasing and developing it. And basically it's a top-down stress test with granular information. And there's no complexity there. Basically you get loan by loan information 
collateral by collateral information linked to those loans, appraisal value for each of the collateral uh, you have, and then the haircut from the appraisal value to the real uh, final uh, price. And this is a, a very simple way of doing a stress testing top down for uh, uh, 90, 95 of uh, significant institutions that mainly have uh, credit risk and that they, if there is a problem, they, it would be a credit risk uh, problem. So I think that this top-down approach needs uh, uh, some uh, reflection and is not that difficult. It's true that uh, it may consume uh, some resources, but the other approach also is very intensive in, in resources. And then finally, and coming to the initial uh, Carmelo uh, uh, proposal on the micro, macro prudential usage of uh, stress testing. Uh, usually stress tests, uh, uh, as uh, Beverly mentioned, are performed bank by bank. So if you have bank by bank results, I think that this is, there is an immediate micro prudential usage. And here, uh, to link uh, uh, very tightly the results of the stress test with the capital requirements, I think that needs also a careful uh, reflection because you may end up in a, in a place that is not uh, satisfactory all the years that you run this uh, exercise. I think that the stress test is a tool to set uh, capital requirements among other uh, potential tools uh, and qualitative assessment that may be needed to set uh, the P2G, uh, for instance. I, I also a firm believer after my experience that a stress test cannot be performed without microprudential supervisors. We may have a very nice top model, uh, a top down uh, model, but you need the interaction with the micro guys, the guys uh, uh, on, the, on, the other, on the other building down the river or up the river, I don't know which way it flows. And, uh, and uh, I think that this is an important part because uh, you need a reality check uh, uh, of uh, your models with uh, uh, the joint supervisory teams that know whether these models are uh, uh, or should be properly applied uh, or not. Double check your uh, results on the projections of the PNL, uh, projections of credit risk, uh, and, and so on. And uh, of course, there may be a, a macroprudential usage uh, for, uh, for stress testing. To me, this macroprudential usage is uh, to set the stance of macroprudential policy, maybe regarding the, uh, the CCYB, to set the stance. Not a, it's not easy to link this directly to a, a direct uh, macroprudential tool. I think that we need to be humble of what we can achieve with uh, this stress test. And finally, and I think that Rochelle's paper was, uh, had a, a very good insight, we need to reflect about uh, whether the scenarios uh, should or should not be counter-cyclical. I mean, a stress testing, uh, uh, stress testing uh, uh, banking sector in bad times probably needs a less, uh, uh, a less stringent scenario than in good times. And this is very important because this is a fundamental way of uh, setting this stance of the macroprudential policy. We also have comments on the governance, but uh, I think that the governance is uh, much easier uh, in bad times than in good times. Thank you. Now to Martin. Thank you. Uh, my name is Martin Chihek. Uh, I lead the division in the IMF that runs the financial sector assessments, including stress tests. And it's a pleasure to see so many people listening and talking about stress testing for, for a whole day. Um, uh, when we started this uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was uh, it was a very very small small exercise, and has obviously uh, uh, grown up. Um, um, and in those early years, when the FSUB started about 20 years ago, there was no question about publication or communication or stress tests. Uh, in fact, the first 12 uh, assessments we've done, you can never see them. We agreed not to ever publish them. Uh, so since then, the debate has moved on quite dramatically. And uh, now quite often we, we see the opposite requests uh, for technical assistance or capacity building on communications of results of stress testing and financial stability reporting. <laughs> And we, we often tend to push back and, and say this is all very nice, but, but first make sure that uh, you, you have a really sort of solid uh, macro prudential stress testing for your own uh, sake before you go out and, and publish. 
And, and so this, this chart uh, is from an, from, from an earlier paper on, on communication where we sort of put out these pros and cons. Here I focus, this is the microprudential stress testing, so it's the kind of ex ante um, stress testing as opposed to the crisis management stress testing, uh, which is a bit more tricky. But anyway, even for those stress tests, uh, there's, uh, there are many, many arguments you, you can make to sort of be, be cautious. And, and one, again, what that comes to mind on, on the macro prudential is this sort of potential for confusion that, uh, again, I think we've seen mentioned a couple, couple of times. You, you sort of, you, in, in some ways, we are victims of the success of, of the stress testing because it has pro proliferated into many different uses. So you have the micro and the macro, bottom up, top, top down. And, and so you have this, the, the communication challenge when you come out with a new stress test uh, to, to explain, well, this is now a purely microprudential stress test. It's not the one that's just micro with some micro overlay. Um, so so that, that creates, uh, creates an additional uh, challenge. The, the obvious one I, I mentioned here is the, so this, this idea that applies mostly for, to the micro, which is the, the, the attempts to game the tests. And after a while, you, you, have, you have this sort of false sense of confidence that you have these very granular micro stress tests. But in a way, you may be missing a, a whole lot of topics uh, that come with, with interconnectedness. Um, so anyway, I think there, there are many examples, uh, and as I'm not picking up on these two, but uh, I think that we can go to, to also to, to IMF reports that oftentimes uh, we, we, have, we have missed uh, in, in our early stress tests, uh, some risks that were incoming. But, but you know, these are some, some examples that obviously didn't turn out the way that these stress tests were, were modeling. And, and you, of course, may know that in the Icelandic case, uh, it was a very traditional sort of solvency-based stress test, and indeed the banks uh, looked very solid, uh, and it did not really have the liquidity in it. And uh, again, the Latvia test didn't expect that the growth of GDP in the right next quarter will be minus 18 year on year. Um, so, so this is an this is an older paper that, that I used uh, this was back in 2006, where we look at the communications of financial stability in FSRs, and we have updated it now. And, it, and it's another new methodology. I stole it from an earlier paper that looked at monetary policy communication, and then it looked at dispersion of inflation forecasts. And what, what what we found is that it's really the quality of communication that matters. And, and so we've done a redo of this paper to just look on stress testing in FSRs. And, and again, we, we we following this earlier paper, um, we we sort of have these three three measures. One is the clarity and the consistency of reporting and the coverage. And here, when we talk about clarity, it means it's not just you're clear what the outcome is, but you're also clear on what the assumptions are and what, what the data are, and, and you know, do, do you put out uh, sort of the underlying the metadata on, on the website? So, so again, we, we ran uh, several sets of probit uh, regressions, uh, looking at probabilities of crisis. First, just looking at the reporting itself, do you report or not? But then you also look at the quality of the reporting. Uh, of course, you have to, there you have to control for the fact that the countries that are report, start to report are more likely to be confident that their system is, is stable. There was also a period when we saw stability reports popping up, uh, so, so we had to sort of uh, in, incorporate this Heckman equation to, to correct for, for the sort of selection bias. And, and the results were, were actually quite, quite striking in the sense that uh, it's, the sort of, uh, it's the high quality or low quality of the reporting that makes the difference. And, and again, it's, it's, it's the fact, you know, how, 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 how much do you disclose on, on, the, on the metadata of the exercise? Um, again, it's, it's a bit different from the sort of pure crisis management uh, exercise. Publication has no link whatsoever. Whether you publish the FSR or the, the results of stress tests or not uh, has no, no, no statistically significant effect. Um, we, we were prohibited from publishing the whole list of the FSRs, but at least for the ones that you see here, this is from an IMF working paper, you see that the quality varies quite, quite widely and it's not, uh, you know, it, it's, it still leaves much to be desired. In this case, the maximum is, is four uh, for these four components. And why is that? Well, especially when it comes to, to the macro prudential stress test, the challenges are, are quite enormous as we've seen. Uh, so, so this is a, a kind of our standard uh, toolkit. Uh, I think that you heard about top down and bottom up, each has these components. This is all very nice and dandy, but then uh, once it, when it comes to the macro prudential stress test, ideally would like to measure the feedback effect uh, going back from the stress test to, to the scenario design. 
again, this is this is something that's that's, that's really challenging first to, to do, uh, and then to explain why why the results attained this way may be quite different from the ones that you just get in the micro prudential stress test. And, and so what I'm talking about here is, is really using the micro data, bank by bank data, to, to feed back into, into the macro, macro scenario design. And we have really done it uh, only on a limited basis in, you know, using structural VAR models. Uh, and, and again, this is something that's still work in progress. So try, try communicating this, uh, you know, leaving aside all these other issues we, we discussed earlier today. I think there, there was an interesting discussion earlier on, on uh, on the building of um, of reputation, and again, if you know, once you you're trying to build a reputation with micro prudential, it's of course even harder because we are not talking about pass and fail of individual banks. This is about uh, sort of coming up with a bottom line assessment for the system as a whole. So, so this has been quite practically a challenge, and that's why most of the published stress tests uh, are, in a way, a simplified version that really gets into the you know, pass and fail and looks at uh, how many banks will be below a certain, certain threshold. Of course, the, the challenge of, of a truly macro prudential stress test is that you need to take into account not only the micro prudential but also the other the other elements of, of the financial stability assessment. So it's the it's the kind of oversight framework and the safety nets you have in place. So here's just an example from from a Caribbean country that we've done assessment recently. Again, one you have very different types of shock you need to consider. So it's not, you know, it's not, the issue is when you're doing macro prudential stress tests, you're not trying to look at uh, just the cycle, but also you're looking at sh uh, shocks that hit from, let's say, the U.S. mainland. So also you have uh, some natural disasters that may that may hit, and then you're trying to interpret the severity of the shocks. And you know, when you look at the results, um, you know, is 22% is, uh, of capital legacy ratio sufficient? Well, you need to know more about the uh, what kind of uh, regulatory and supervisory framework you have, you have in place. And, and again, I think it's, uh, this is one sort of simplified way that uh, this, this particular exercise was presented. Um, I mentioned we've been doing these um, assessments for 20 years now. Uh, so uh, on the occasion of this anniversary, we are, we've been reviewing um, and we are, uh, the, the, the stress test and the, the whole FSAP. Uh, so there'll be, um, the review will be finished by, by summer. Actually, today there's a paper that you can download on the IMF stress testing. But we, we did do a survey of, of country authorities uh, around the world uh, about what they see as the main priority. Interestingly, the, the, the two areas that, that came most strongly were interconnectedness, uh, including cross-border. And it's, then it was the non-banks, because you need to add up with non-banks and market-based finance. And so, so when you add those up, those were, those were important. And then we also had quite a, quite uh, intense interest in these uh, emerging topics uh, like cyber stress testing, which we've done so far once in Singapore. Um, uh, work on fintech stress testing again once, uh, and then uh, push for more analysis on climate. And some of these new topics uh, make make the challenges of of communicating stress tests even even larger because, of course, with the transition risk on climate, you you're not dealing with a a stress test uh, that sort of uh, is sort of more you know counter cyclical, but something that's more like a structural change in the economy happening over over decades. So again, it's a, it's a very different uh, type type of exercise. Uh, we've started uh, um, we've started in in this vein. Uh, we have an ongoing one on, on Norway. Um, so so this is something that's uh, that's quite quite exciting. Anyway, back, back, back to the topic. Uh, again, I think we are on communication. I think uh, uh, I think it's important to make this distinction between kind of the experimental exercises we talk, talked about and, and sort of the basic exercises that uh, that Jesus has highlighted, and oftentimes can be can be quite insi insightful because they are more transparent and easier to explain, as long as as you're very clear about the the caveats or or the the assumptions that you're making. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, well, let's have questions, if, and maybe if you can, if you have in mind someone who should answer specifically your question, then. Yeah, actually, I would have uh, three questions. Then let's say maybe we don't cover. I mean, you don't cover all of them. But so the first one would be for Jesus. Like uh, you made this point about uh, top down. Let's say against uh, bottom up. Uh, clarifying that for you, top-down, it means that uh, the machine is in the hands of a policy authority, let's say. 
Um, and I mean, if I understand correctly, I understood that uh, you kind of think that the top-down approach, like, let's say, has some advantages with respect to the bottom-up. I mean, I would tend to share this view, and um, but my question would be now whether you think that kind of a top-down exercise could be really conducted in the SSM, let's say, euro area context, where basically, I mean, let's say, uh, I mean, banks are much more heterogeneous than maybe in only one country. Basically, we have different business models. The number of banks is much higher than, for example, in the US, the ones that are covered in the DFAST or CCAR. And then, basically, on top, also, there is the issue that, uh, despite, I mean, the amount of data that we have available is kind of growing and improving year by year, basically. Still, I mean, we don't have such granular data as, uh, for example, they were used in these papers today from the colleagues from the Fed. So, I mean, in principle, what I mean is that I would tend to agree with your view, but I would like to hear your feedback, basically, whether you think it would be something doable at the current stage, basically, in the SSM context. And then maybe, like, if I might, I might ask um, a, a question to, to Beverly as well. Um, as regards you kind of pointed out to some elements that the macroprudential stress test uh, should feature, and I totally agree with those. Um, something like interconnectedness, uh, etc. let's say. I would understand also that at the moment, like for example, DFAST, uh, CCAR do not cover some of these elements, uh, because maybe they are more used for also for macroprudential uh, purposes. Um, I was wondering whether in the Fed you are planning to conduct or you are already con conducting some similar exercises, like something like more ma macroprudential exercises in parallel, or if you are planning to do something like that uh, in the future. And then maybe, okay, I would have also a fair question, but maybe let's see if... Um, Okay, I uh, also have a question for um, Ms. Sirtle and Mr. Saurina regarding, so you mentioned that of course one has to weigh the complexity and where to put the complexity uh, in how to de design the stress test, also that it involves a lot of granular data and a lot of resources in uh, working on this data. So I would like to ask you what you think about how, um, also regarding the design of the stress test, where the competitive advantage lies on the side of the supervisor and the regulator to work on the data that you have available in forms of the top-down uh, approach can, of course, being the regulator, having the information on all the banks simultaneously produce much more information that a bank can produce on its own. And what do you think about how to factor that into the design of stress test. Okay, we'll take one more question and then we answer this round, then we'll see if there's a second round. Thanks, uh, thanks to everyone for the very interesting presentations. One remark to Jesus, you might be accused of laziness with the slides, not with conceptual laziness. That was a very forceful and clear presentation, thank you. Uh, I have a, a one, uh, I want to go back a bit to um, Diane's presentation. Uh, so you were talking about arbitrage, regulatory arbitrage, uh, in connection to stress tests. Uh, so it was more about the playing with risk weights, playing with the allocation, uh, the type of asset. Uh, so let's imagine, and, and the stress tests are mostly conducted with quarterly data, like the, the one top down, with very granular uh, quarterly data. So let's imagine you solve that problem, you solve that link. There is still the issue of regulatory arbitrage that takes place uh, within the quarter, and this can be very large. Like a canonical example, the repo window dressing by some European banks. This reverberates through the entire financial system. It's seen in the, in the Fed's balance sheet, it's seen in, it's seen in FX swap basis in currencies which are not the euro. Uh, so um, how, how should one think about this? Uh, and does it maybe change or increase the role of one of the corners of your triangle, namely the, the supervisors? Thank you. Maybe you want to start, uh, okay. Jesus and Diane. All right. So, um, so the first question was about um, whether you know the Fed is working on other other forms of stress testing that build in some of the internal linkages. The answer, I think, is is yes. I mean, there's a pretty active research community, you know, across the entire Federal Reserve system thinking about and, and building those models. Um, I, I don't want to speak for, for, the, uh, for, 
the staff or, or the Board of Governors, I'm in no position to do so being at the New York Fed, but there is, uh, you know, recently begun to release a financial stability report twice a year that looks at, uh, um, among other things, interconnectedness, leverage, li li liquidity, um, you know, across a, a bunch of sectors, including banks and non-banks, so that there is analysis that, that is done that goes into looking at some of those other factors. We at the New York Fed, um, in our Liberty Street economic blog series, released the results of, uh, of some models that looked at fire sale was. I think Fernando, who is sitting over there, is going to talk about some of the, some of the modeling that uh, was underneath some of that you'll hear tomorrow. So, you know, it, it, we're not, um, at least at the New York Fed, um, well, I, they're not things that, have, that are set in the same supervisory consequences that the, the CCAR is, because that is a supervisory program. Um, uh, you know, but, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, work and analysis that, that's going on. I'm sorry, what was the second, I, I didn't have something to write down. The second, uh, the second question was just. Where to put complexity oh, where, advantage of the supervisor. Oh, the advantage that the supervisor has. Um, I think the way I would answer that is that, um, it, it's, it's not so much about whether from the top down or bottom up. They, they both, at least in the, the CCAR program, involve a lot of complexity. A big part of what is done in the supervisory review as part of the CCAR program is looking at the models that the banks use to do their own stress testing. Um, and there's a lot of complexity in both ways. I think the one advantage of the top down the way the Fed has done it is it's the same models for everybody. So you know you're getting an apples to apples comparison, same model, same scenario, um, and and you know, with with the differences varying, you know, based on the on the very granular input data. Um, so that, you know, in a sense that the exact same loan held at two different banks should, you know, generate the same kind of losses at, at the two different banks. Um, um, and so it's that, it's ability to have a, a common framework where you can say, well, this is everybody together. What does this look like for the system, even if the system consists of, you know, just adding up the pieces? I think that's maybe the advantage, one of the important advantages of, of having top-down estimates. Thank you, Cosimo. Uh, well, the, the, the first obvious uh, answer is uh, call the consultants. Uh, they will uh, organize uh, you the, the top-down exercise uh, without uh, any problem. No, now, uh, uh, as they did in the past, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, more seriously, I think that uh, one way uh, uh, you, you point to, to the right problem of uh, too many banks, a uh, significant uh, amount of banks, but maybe this is a, there is a scope for a true uh, cooperation with national authorities that may have models uh, locally applied and you check the consistency, but uh, in, uh, in, a, in, let's say, in a enhanced cooperation with uh, national competent authorities, I think that it's possible to, to run uh, this exercise. And then time is uh, uh, on your side because an accredit is uh, <laughs> is building, uh, and there are other national authorities that have uh, credit registered with different coverage, uh, but uh, you also can explore this, uh, this credit register together with the national authorities. So, uh, uh, frankly, I, I don't think that this is a, 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 a big problem. It is true that you need to have this as a medium-term objective. This is not for tomorrow, cannot be implemented tomorrow, neither next year or in the coming two years. But the important thing is whether you agree on the, on the direction of travel or not. And for me, this is a fundamental question: uh, where, who who controls uh, the uh, uh, the the, uh, the exercise? If I may ask uh, uh, your colleague uh, uh, next uh, next to you, uh, uh, I think that uh, supervisors have a significant advantage. They can ask for the granular data. I mean, on my right is an example of a supervisor that asks the granular data, loan by loan, right? So, uh, or collateral by collateral. So this is something that uh, it is not for tomorrow, but I think it's a significant, a significant uh, 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 potential ability that the supervisors uh, have. The micro, the macro, uh, both, uh, both of them. And you need to develop um, modeling teams and so on. And the cooperation uh, with the national authorities, I think that uh, could be uh, uh, really uh, very, very, uh, uh, very useful. And if I may also, although the, co the, the, the question was not for me, but uh, uh, listen, you are not going to be uh, never happy. 
uh, with this uh, uh, line of reasoning because uh, you say year uh, end of date uh, end of year data uh, they arbitrage then you ask for quarterly data then monthly data then weekly then daily and the, then intraday data you are not going to be uh, happy uh, the answer is very easy send the JSTs to the bank thank you you see what I mean? <laughs> so about the regulatory uh, arbitrage within the quarter or, or window dressing, I would call this window dressing. Uh, I, I'm well aware, uh, aware of that because I've been working also on U.S. money market funds data and uh, money market funds in the U.S. have to report on a monthly basis and European banks report on a quarterly basis. So if you look at investments of U.S. money market funds in European banks, it's very, it's very funny to see um, the seasonality. Um, so, and why do we have this a bit less in, in, in the U.S.? Is because in the U.S. banks have to also report average uh, capital ratios over the quarter. So, and that, that supposes that uh, the, the supervisor is collecting uh, data at a more frequent uh, basis than, than the quarterly level. So there, there are some data actually at the monthly level that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, well, market measures can also be a way because market measures are available on a daily basis or even, or even more frequently. Um, so if you want to compare with market measures, you will also have that, that domain, dimension. But also, in general, asking or supervisors asking for more and more granular data at the, at the single exposure uh, name, uh, at the borrower name level, um, you might also think that asking for more fre frequent uh, uh, data might, might be, of course, there's a cost for that, but uh, that might be also, there might be some value in that. Uh, uh, of course, with this multiplicity of constraints that we impose on banks, they are more and more innovative in, in their way of, of doing a regulatory arbitrage. Um, uh, so recently, uh, when I was uh, talking with the S uh, Swiss uh, supervisor, they were telling me that there is also regulatory arbitrage at the, when, when banks have to report the exposures. Um, so there, there is, there, the more you impose constraints and the more severe the constraints are, the, the, li more, the little uh, the room for maneuvers of banks are, the more they are going to be innovative, of course, in, in, in the way they do ab arbitrage. Thank you. Other questions? So thank you um, to the panel very much. I, th I thought it was a really interesting discussion. I had um, some, I'm not exactly sure who my question is directed at because most of the time when um, you're talking about um, stress tests, there were more sort of stress tests where the scenarios feature, you know, very sort of acute business and credit cycle downturn type scenarios. But um, I guess I had a question to do with like, so, you know, everyone who works on financial stability talks a lot about low for long, low for long um, interest rates. And so I suppose my th question is, um, you know, on your thoughts um, for thinking about more of these types of like very slow burn type scenarios um, as opposed to, you know, more acute um, type scenarios. And, um, you know, the challenges, usefulness of using stress tests to actually look at these sorts of scenarios, like low for long type scenarios. Um, you know, what, what were your thoughts on that? Well, I guess I can answer this one because uh, the um, EBA exercise that is going to be performed in 2020, the, the, the scenario was published a week ago, and it is a low for long scenario. So there is the usual downturn and drop in asset prices, but there is also uh, a shift downwards and an inversion of the yield curve. Uh, now, I don't know whether you call, with the three years, you call that low for long enough. Uh, so <laughs> maybe... Um, there could be a case to try and project that even further. But let's say that this year, the, the ESRB, which is the body that, that chooses the relevant risk, um, decided that this was, was worth exploring. Uh, the, the current framework is over three years. Um, I think from a top-down perspective, we could, since we will have the starting points, we could extend that for longer. Uh, of course, the question is, the, the more you extend it, the more you, you would have to model what banks would do. Uh, 
because the, the EBA exercise is a, is a static exercise. So already it's a bit of a stretch to say that nothing happens over three years. But if you were to wonder what happens if we have another 10 years of, of low interest rates, then I think this is something that in the current framework in Europe where banks are not asked to provide their reactions, this is something we would have to do here as a sort of top-down projection where we, we do have models that project banks' reactions to such a scenario. And indeed, it would be interesting to try that. But we're going in that direction. Okay, that's the short answer to the question. Other questions? Okay, well then, thanks a lot to everyone, and we'll see you tomorrow morning.